Morning, everyone. If I could have my slides when we get a moment, gentlemen. It, there we go. Oh, can we start at the beginning? First thing I have to do, starting at the beginning, I have to explain the comedy job title. Please do not for a minute think we were serious with that. Right. I have a special job at Microsoft. It's a unique job. One of the things you'll know about Microsoft is we love to talk to our customers about our technology and our products. But what we don't do enough of is talk about the human beings that use them. So my job, exclusively my job, is to project out to the future and think about the future of society. How are people going to want to live, work, and play in the future? So essentially, my job is about the future of humanity. Now, when you have a job that's about the future of humanity, I think you'll agree that you need a job title with a certain degree of pomposity to support that. <laughs> I think you'll agree we've achieved that. And then the second thing, I told me mum when I was a kid, I said, mum, one day, I'm going to be CEO at Microsoft. You just watch me. <laughs> and the best bit about that is, even though there's an opening, that's still the only way I'm going to pull this off. <laughs> So just a little bit more about me. I'm glad that we had the context of Google bringing their parents to the British Museum. You see how much Microsoft and Google are working together because I don't brought my parents, but I do have a picture of me mum in me slide deck. And this is a picture of me mum because it's important because when I was a kid, I grew up in a really unhealthy dose of Star Trek and comic books. And I know what you're thinking, right? You know, here's a guy who works for one of the world's largest technology companies, dedicated his career to IT, and also quite like Star Trek. What a surprise. But Star Trek's really important, right? That's my mum and my auntie Mabel. It's my eighth birthday party. And the reason this is important, because Star Trek teaches you that technology is a force for good. It's something special that enables human beings to live beyond their means, do things that were not otherwise possible. And I bought all of that. I was a young, naive, gullible kid, and I wanted more from technology. I chose a career in IT because I wanted to do great things with technology. My challenge, 25 years in, as I get older and more cynical and more miserable, is I look around and I think, oh my God, what went wrong? What is happening? We have become slaves to technology. Technology defines how we work. It has not liberated us, but become a prison. And we set out to change that because we think the potential is still there. We think technology will enable us to do great things, not just in how we work, but how we live our lives. And we wanted to expose some of that. Just to set the scene, we do this every uh, audience we speak to. Could you humor me and put your hand up if you have a computer at home? Could you keep your hand up if the computer you have at home is better than the one you have at work? What a surprise! It's most of you! I love doing it to a public sector audience. It's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel at that point. <laughs> Cheap jokes, I'm sorry. But it's true. But the thing is, it doesn't matter where you go, whichever organization you talk to, people have a richer experience of technology in their personal lives than they do in their professional lives. We have grandparents Skyping their grandkids. You live online, you shop online, you play games, you communicate, you collaborate. You have a wonderful technical experience at home. And then you go to work. <laughs> and you cross the threshold, and all of a sudden, you're a dumb user. There's a long-haired, beardy git like me in IT who just likes to say, mm, no, you can't. No, you can't do that. And the thing is, I've spent my entire career chasing people down corridors like some bizarre, freakish stalker, just trying to get them to care about what technology might do for them. That chase still happens today, but it's the other way around. Because all of you who have this rich, incredible technology experience in your personal lives are now chasing me down the corridor saying, hang on a minute. If I can do all this stuff at home, why can't I do it at work? And so we wanted to really understand this problem, we want to articulate this problem, we want to motivate this problem. So I wrote a book, I wrote a book called Business Reimagined. And the book, the other confession I should have told you is I used to be an IT consultant. Again, what a surprise. And the thing about being an IT consultant is you learn to never give away the answers. I was a good IT consultant, let me tell you. And the book is a provocation. It doesn't tell you what the future is going to be like explicitly. It points to problem areas. It hopes to evoke emotion and response in all of you, in employers and employees, to want to do things differently. And I, the book, we have some copies available outside. If you've got a Kindle, you can get it for free on Amazon. And we have some QR codes. If you see me, I can give you a, a free download. But the book is just the context. It's the context for a very different way of working. One of the hooks we used was the study we saw in the US last year that showed on average 71% of the American workforce is disengaged at work, not really that bothered about what they do. 
And I'm not making any moral judgment about whether it's better to live to work or work to live, but frankly, if you think about the amount of time we will all spend at work in our working lives, the thought of not being engaged, frankly, terrifies me. We've seen similar numbers in the UK. And what we see is there is a problem, not with work itself, but how we go about work, where we work, the tools we use for work. And so we wanted to articulate that. Much of the problem comes down to productivity. Our definition of productivity has shaped the way we work. It's created, however, two important problems in the workplace. We've gone from organizations who were focused on the end result of what they did, the outcome of what they did, and they've moved away to focusing on the processes, standardized processes. So for example, if I work for a car manufacturer, I no longer make cars. You've got me on the widget production line, and I'm making widgets. And why this is the gesture for widget making, I don't know. It just feels right. Making widgets, pulling pints, it's all the same. But the thing is, when I'm now making widgets, I'm not making the car, you've done two things to me. Number one, you've disconnected me from the outcome of the organization. I don't give a stuff how good the car is because you're paying me on widgets. My bonus will get paid on how many and how good the widgets are that I make. But secondly, and most importantly, by creating an organization based on standardized processes, you've created a rigid sclerotic skeleton inside the organization that cannot change. If you need to change, if your market changes, if you need to stop making cars and start making airplanes, you cannot change because your entire organization is based on a series of interlinked standardized processes. So productivity itself, the way we define productivity, has become the problem. And then there's the place of work. The place of work is a, one of the biggest constraints people face in actually doing work. How many of you work in an open plan office? Right, open plan offices were genius in the 50s and 60s when you were in the West Coast US and you wanted to get a group of people working together on a project. The only choice you had was to shove them in the middle of the floor, get them to talk to each other. How many of you sit in your open plan offices and email the person that's just two desks away? <laughs> what time should we do lunch? I don't know. Where are we going to go? I don't know. So this whole concept about shoving people together belittles the potential that technology delivers in how we collaborate. It constrains the way we think. People who, if you ram a bunch of people from the same organization together, they start to think like each other. Creativity goes out of the window. There is no space for creativity. You don't have the cognitive headroom in these chaotic, noisy, disruptive, open plan offices. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should get rid of open plan office, but we should be mindful of the work we have to do and where is the best location, a subject to which we'll come back to. So all of these things lead to a challenge. We have a problem with the process of work, we have a problem with the place of work, and we have a problem with some of the tools of work becoming a prison. Working smarter is no longer an option. There is only working harder. Send more emails. And I refuse to accept that that's our future. Remember where I started, loved up on a beautiful utopian vision of what technology was going to enable our society. I refuse to accept that the future of work is about replicating the things that we've always done and just making them a bit better, a bit quicker, or a bit cheaper. Technology affords us the opportunity to do things fundamentally different, to reimagine the way our businesses work. There are some things that we can do. Number one is we need to reclaim the definition of what it means, of what work means. Work should not be a destination. It's not a place you go. Work is an activity. It is something you do. And for too long, when we've talked about flexible working, people have just heard, oh, working from home. Well, working from home is part of working flexibly, but true flexible working, proper flexible working, is about being mindful about the things you have to do that very day and then choosing the best location from which to do them. It's choosing whether to be in the office because you need to talk to your colleagues, to be at your customer's premise because you need to be closer to your customer, to write that report, should you be anywhere but the local village library or a coffee shop or some space where you could be quiet. Flexible working is about empowering individuals to make that choice, equipping them with a technology that supports that choice. And then there's this new area of the social business. Some people call it enterprise social. This is essentially how we use the principles of social media that have transformed the way that we communicate and collaborate to effect a fundamental change in how we collaborate at work. How many of you uh, remember, about 20 years ago, if you bought a product or consumed a service in the UK and you wanted to complain, the only thing that you had available, the only thing you could do would be to do that very British thing and write a strongly worded letter. Dear sir, madam, I was disgusted the other day, blah, blah, blah. That will show them. And then maybe, if you were lucky, three months later, you'd get a response. 10 years ago, you'd pick up the phone, and you'd spend four hours in voicemail hell, and then eventually, if you were dead lucky, you'd get to talk to a human being. Today, thanks to things like Twitter, 
I can contact not just the organization, but pretty much I can contact the specific individual that's responsible for the product or service to which I have a complaint. And that kind of engagement, that kind of proximity to the people that you want to talk to fundamentally changes your expectation of collaboration. And that only has to happen three or four times in your personal life before you start to realize what it can do in your professional life. But the interesting thing is it's created two different cultures of collaboration. There's the new culture of collaboration where everything should be open and transparent and everybody should have access because it enables a democratization of the workforce. And then there's the old guard. And we all work in the old guard, we all know organizations like this. This is a world where knowledge is power. I'm not sharing anything. These two worlds are coming together inside the workforce, a world that is there to share and a world that is there not to share. And we need to figure out what we do. The thing that we know is that the more open and transparent you are, the more agile your business can become. And then this is where we enter the world of those sickly, sweet, cheesy North American motivational posters because this is all about leadership, not management. But it's true. Leadership is key to this. And the special thing about leaders is we're all leaders. Every single person inside your organization is a leader. Leaders are there to empower people. Good leaders do two things. The first thing they do is they make sure that everyone in the organization or their team knows what the outcome is that they're trying to achieve. And then the second thing they do is they get out of the way. And that changes empowerment inside individuals. It changes their engagement with the organization. It asks them to be responsible, to be involved in what the organization is trying to achieve. It fundamentally changes everything you do. So my request for you over the next two days is have your ears open, your eyes open, communicate with us, look for what you can do inside your organizations, not to do things slightly better, but to fundamentally reimagine the way that you work. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Philip. So I want to continue the journey. Dave has talked a bit about people, and my talk will carry on that theme. It's a very people-centric view of the world. Because I think when you talk about people and you look at how they're clustering, how they're communicating, um, that's where we're going to get new challenges and new um, innovation within the world of work and the workplace. And Jelly Bean working is the answer. I'll introduce it to you in a second. If you look at the kind of three pillars of where we are in the world of work, people, place, technology, the focus here today is both technology, but that new intersection, which is where we call clusters. Who comes together? Who should be together? in between people and physical space. And when you look at the forces that are reshaping work, there are now some very powerful, new, um, unavoidable forces at work. And the focus today will be on the technology, ICT, which we think will drive significant change going forwards. Now, Jeremy talked about this kind of wonderful 10 years of work tech. I went back to 2005, just after we first started, and look at that phenomenal image. This was the anointment of the Pope in 2005, and look how the same image in the same place in St. Peter's Square looks almost 10 years later. You forget how quickly the world has changed, and that view is a remarkable indication as to how fast we're moving in behaviors. And I think when you look at that front cover also from 2005, you know, we triggered then this remarkable change in technology to where we are today. We were back in these days on the left-hand side, cabling, um, Netscape Navigator just launched, mobile phones were large bricks, and look where we've gone to so far. There's a remarkable move now to the cloud. These are just a few of the players in this new thing called cloud-based software platforms and so on. And what we're seeing here with all these players from you know, Microsoft with 365, Google, Box, Flickr, you name it, is consumption economics. The idea that you now pay per use, pay on demand. Now, can we apply consumption rules to the workplace? Can workplace become a service, just as software is becoming a service? And on the West Coast, this is happening. Liquid space is now providing workplace as a service. Remarkable changes in the way people will consume physical space, as Dave has talked about, for work. And just as this is changing, you're well aware of the massive growth of social media, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people using the key media that we're familiar with. Facebook, Twitter, and so on. 1.2 billion people now on Facebook, a remarkable data-centric view of the world when you begin to profile what they're doing. And social media is disruptive 
It is remarkable what it's doing. You're well aware of, of, of what's swept through um, the Middle East and North Africa with this obsession with social media that is bombarding people to an extent that it's creating not velvet revolutions, but kind of Twitter revolutions, the ability to actually change um, nation states through social media. And there's this big debate about privacy. Do we mind being exposed through technology, where we are, what we're doing? That's the big debate going on. Do we mind being tracked inside buildings? That'll be a huge debate going forwards. One of my favorite websites at the moment is this one. Who's gonna volunteer that they've used this website? No show of hands. This is called IJustMadeLove.com. And I actually logged into it last night just to check on the figures. Um, and 292,000 people had registered. Um, I am perplexed as to what's going on in North London. Um, central London I can get. Anyone here live in North London? Does it, any, any explanation for this? One or two. So for some reason, 168 people, just near, near, near Barnet, I think that is, um, were having lots of fun for some reason. And it even lets you um, add some detail in, in, into what you're doing. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not convinced that we mind about privacy. If that's what's going on globally, do people really care about sharing? KLM are now going to start you letting, letting you book your airline seat not by the fact you want a window or aisle, but who you know on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, or who you might like to know on Facebook or LinkedIn. So you'll look at the airline and actually sit yourself near someone that perhaps meets your profile. Um, and so we're seeing a world where we believe that will happen in the workplace. You know, I think that very soon inside a workplace, you will, you will see people around the environment, not anonymous human beings, but people connected to you via LinkedIn, with their jelly bean, or via Yammer and Twitter, in real time, and they'll begin to appear within the physical space. And of course, that space will then connect people together. So the idea of being anonymous at work in the building will vanish very, very quickly. The building will become a real-time asset. It will know who, where, who people are, where they are, what they're doing, what they should be doing, and will begin to interact with them. And it will be contextual. Contextual filtering is the next big play in real-time real estate. The building will react and filter and present knowledge based on who you are and what you're trying to do in real time. And therefore, this idea of connecting the unconnected would be the next big revolution in property. Cisco tell us that 50 billion inanimate objects will be on the internet in the next six or seven years. So almost anything at work will have a connection. And therefore, what we'll find is this incredible breadth of technology coming throughout the workplace and beyond to let you do very different things inside buildings, which will move from being very dumb containers and offline to being really very exciting real-time assets. And they'll know what's happening inside them and who's in and what they're doing. And therefore, we'll begin to load balance buildings. This is a new technology uh, in wireless called Maru and uh, added to, uh, an overlay called Meraki, which load balances. It can tell you who's in the building, where they're going, what the footfall is and it can change the nature of how you profile a building and see what's happening inside it. And then you look at this. This is in retail. Um, on the left-hand side, these funny addresses are called MAC addresses. These are the, are the numbers that identify your smartphones and your iPads and your tablets. The retailers are now getting these as you walk into a store, whether you want to give them to the retailer or not. As long as your Wi-Fi is on, you're broadcasting that number. So they can tell you that you've been into that store three times that week to buy bottles of wine. They can greet you in different ways as soon as you check in. So very soon you'll be asked to check in to any physical environment, be it a retail store or a gym, you name it, probably through Facebook. And as soon as you've done that, of course the space will interact with you. You'll be communicated to based on the fact you're in the space. You might be offered obviously vouchers, discounts, loyalty points and so on. But the really clever thing is that they'll know not just what you've bought historically from that shop or, or, or retail space, they'll know what you've been browsing on the internet in the minutes or hours before you walked in. So retailers will tell you've been browsing for a new lawnmower or whatever it might be, and will interact with you as you walk into the space. So the idea of omni-channel futures, customer-centric retail is happening, the same will come into buildings. And therefore we're seeing this in Singapore labs, um, we're seeing here on your smartphone, it tells you where you are in the building, it tells you what desks are empty, who's occupying the desks. You check in by touching your phone to readers, which is now using this technology called near field communications, NFC. 
once you've checked in, of course, you can see where people are in real time. You see individuals' faces, you watch them moving around, and soon it'll overlay Twitter, Yammer, Facebook, SharePoint in real time inside the workplace, linking people together by what they're thinking and what they're doing. So the workplace will become a real-time connected community. And here, when you look at who's emailing who inside an office, you can begin to accommodate the real networks taking place. So here, for example, this group of red dots are people who are emailing each other. They may sit on different floors, they may be in different buildings, but you as people who are concerned with workplace can see that cluster of dots and say, well, look, let's put them together. Let's sit them in the same environment and connect them to avoid email overload and to improve process and increase kind of velocity and speed. And therefore, we say goodbye to the kind of corporate hierarchy, the method of planning buildings based on a kind of dead hierarchy of command and control, and instead something very different based around the idea that people are connecting to people. And here's where the jelly bean comes from. You can begin to see that when in any communications platform here, Link, you can say that you're available, busy, you're right back, or you might appear to be away. I quite like that one. And therefore, what colour is your jelly bean will become the most significant factor in the way you begin to work. And the jelly bean will be everywhere. It'll be on video calls. It will even be when you're co-editing or co-authoring a Word document together with other people simultaneously at the same time with colleagues or clients either in the same building or across the world. So this will come very quickly and will change the nature of how you accommodate people, how you cluster people and bring them together. Choosing your colour, I think, will be the key indicator. But certainly will be management. I think it will be management by jelly beans going forwards. What we're finding is the idea of virtuality will then break down the boundaries. You'll begin to see a jelly bean, your instant message. You'll see a colleague across the world as though they were in the same room, and you'll communicate them uh, with them in a different way, in a different sequence. And therefore, you'll begin to get these command centers for jelly bean management. This is a social media command center in National Australia Bank in Melbourne. And here, they map in real time all aspects of social media, social networking, and so on. We think very soon these will be commonplace, a method of mapping the real organization at work and who's interested in who. And therefore, kind of to challenge Dave's point, where does innovation come from? You know, innovation isn't about that kind of eureka moment, that kind of one person in a vacuum having a great idea. The real killer is people like Stephen Johnson, who proved that this quote here from this wonderful book that I recommend, he says that innovation springs out of the adjacent possible. The most inventive places are hives of activity where people get together and share ideas. And therefore, the office has to be somewhere that people still come together to share ideas, to work together. And I want to challenge this idea of work anywhere, Dave, because I think that the danger of flexibility, of moving off into this atomized world of working from anywhere, may kill innovation. And therefore, we'll hear from Charles Handy tomorrow, the, whole, the famous sigmoid curve, which is where companies die because they fail to recognize that crucial point where they have to innovate. So back to this diagram. It's all about clusters, and I think that's the next big challenge for workplace, is how you as professionals don't just leave it to chance, but engineer the kind of environments, clusters, and gatherings that businesses will have uh, in the future for success. Thank you. You didn't tell me you are going to challenge me. You said, turn and resent. What's all that about? You're supposed to agree sagely, and then let me get away with it. Um, it's a great point, Philip, and I think part of the challenge that we have, especially around the context of flexible working, again, if you're not hearing f uh, working from home, you're hearing, well, oh, you never go into the office. And that's not true at all. This is about finding the right balance. And the balance will be different for different individuals, and it'll be different for different organizations and teams. But it's to make sure that you've got this sense of connection, this regular heartbeat of being in the same physical space. We're human beings. That's never going to change about us. But the tools, they give us the ability to be mindful about that's the best place to be. How many of you have an unbearably humiliating commute? You know, I do. I have a two-hour commute to my office. If I spend all that time going into my office just so I can do work that I could have done somewhere else closer to home, that's a bad place to be. So I only go to my office when I need to see, when I want to be seen by my colleagues. So that's the difference, I think. I think that's key, but then how do you get the right people together in the same space at the same time? So what I'm seeing, I went around some buildings in Silicon Valley recently, and I went to one big IT company. You walk around, it feels like a morgue. There was no one there. And you know, if you come in on Monday, 
and I come in on Tuesday, you come in on Wednesday, we might spend days without actually being together, which is what's happening. On Friday, office occupancy is now plummeting um, when you look at figures. So the trouble with Steve, um, Steve's view is if you don't get the adjacent possible right, if you don't get people who are potentially unplanned together at the right time, you don't get innovation. Uh, absolutely. And I, and I think there are two things there. So one, one is about managing that. You know what, if I keep missing you, may, maybe I might just... There's this thing called a telephone, Philip. It's brilliant. You know, I can speak to people real time. They're just genius. Um, so the first of all, communicate. But then I, I do agree with your point, though, because one of the things you miss out on is this whole serendipitous discovery, bumping into you, actually not working in the same team of you, but actually knowing that you've maybe got some insight that might help me think differently about the problem. But also, there's an opportunity, and I guess where I want to challenge some of your thinking is around this concept of, of social networking. And, and if we all belong to multiple federated social networks, how do you ever get critical mass for the individual? Because maybe I'm off over here in Yammer having a conversation, and you're off over there in LinkedIn. It's both great work, but never gets connected back to the audience. That's terrible. My mum would kill me. You're over here. Yeah. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you connect those separate networks? I think that's a key issue, isn't it? Because we have too many different places to go for knowledge and for communication. And Maybe that's a Microsoft challenge. Where, where should, where's the one place that we should go? I mean, going to email, and then to Yammer, and then to Link, and there are just too many discrete places to go to kind of get a vision for connections. I think the other thing which is potentially worrying is the idea that whatever you see has been pre-filtered. So again, you know, if you think about where we're all heading, should we have somebody, or a piece of software, or an algorithm, filtering what we see? So all we get to look at is something that people think is good for us or right for us. What was interesting in, in some of the research for Jelly Beans is the idea that Andy Boyd gave us from Shell, who's knowledge management, and he was saying that when they post a question on a web discussion forum, half the respondents come from people that were unknown to the person posing the question, and the best answers came from those who were unknown. So he said, surely you invite the wrong people to meetings, you ask the wrong people on email. And therefore, that's an issue, isn't it? It absolutely is. And that's one of the reasons why I think that a lot of the future belongs to this enterprise social. So email is, is a fantastic tool, but we're using it for many of the wrong things today. If we have conversations using tools like Yammer or other open transparency tools, like Twitter, for example, then actually that information exists and people have access to it. How many, people, how many times do you have a, an individual join your company only to ask the same bloody questions again and again and again? And you may get sick of that, but then you realize that actually they're only asking those questions because they're locked up in your inboxes. So I think the answer is to have that open, transparent collaboration. I don't think necessarily it's about choosing one platform either, but it's about making sure if they're open and transparent, they can be connected and searched. I, I challenge your point about filtering, though, because filtering is important but not exclusively. And you need to understand when you're being shown information that has been filtered, it's been selected for you. Email, again, is a natural form of filtering because you have a known um, audience, you have a known set of people to which you're talking to. But understanding when it's being filtered and when it's not being filtered can help you make those choices. Okay, um, interesting. Um, I particularly like I just made love.com where you celebrate afterwards with a post-coital e-cigarette. Um, uh, I think the issue that you're both getting to is around levels of privacy and openness, because uh, you may have seen Lord Ashdown's intervention this morning about the security services and, and, you know, and how we're being monitored uh, and how our email traffic is being read. Um, and there are, you know, there are, there are big privacy issues, and then there are kind of local privacy issues. Um, I'd like to throw this open to the audience. So, so Dave and, and Philip have given us this brave new world of, 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 of technology, differences of opinion, which is good. Um, you know, those of you who are trying to run organizations and think about the IT policies in your companies, come back to, uh, uh, come back to Philip and Dave. Comments, questions, who'd like to kick us off? Now, the first question is always very difficult, so we'll, we'll take the second question first. Okay, <laughs> gentlemen there. If you could say who you are and where you're from. Just shout loud. Facebook and all this other stuff that's out there, but I can't even 
cope with what I've got already? So it's a great question. And, and one of the conversations we hear a lot is, you know, especially when we deliver a tool like Yammer, is you know, people typically say, oh, brilliant. So now I've got another inbox. I've got to check. Well, the problem is that the focus is on the tool rather than the cultural change it affords. So, for example, when I turn up with another tool, it's like me putting a second telephone on your desk. There you go. I've made you twice as effective now, twice as collaborative. Ah, maybe I haven't. But the reality is it's the culture. So, for example, you use those two tools in very different ways. We still feel that email is a container. I must answer or read every single email I get sent. I have this stupid perception of the nirvana of inbox zero, that my life will somehow be better <laughs> if I've cleared my inbox. In fact, we, we did a study that showed 77% of the UK workforce believe a productive day in the office is clearing their email. This is how bad the problem is. Now contrast that to how you use social media, where social media is a fast flowing river and the information is there, number one, only when you are there for that moment in time, but second, you can search it. So the way you use these tools is you don't go and read it all to, uh, at the time that it comes in, you only go and read it at the time that you need the information. So I need to find out more about this topic. Let me go and search what's been said, rather than having to deal with everything yourself. And it's that cultural change. That's the really tricky bit in all of this that you need to, to really focus on. And the, uh, the early days of email were fascinating, though, because people would send you a fax and then email you and say, I've sent you a fax. <laughs> Remember that. Because people weren't quite sure which method and means of communication to use. I think the answer, partly, is the idea of the jelly bean. So if you see someone's green and available, you might instant message them because you know they're able to respond straight away or use social media. If you see their jelly bean that's kind of red and therefore busy, you send an email, which is asynchronous, so it doesn't need a kind of immediate response. So I think what we'll find is, is different digital kind of etiquette coming when people can kind of choose their medium. A friend of mine, uh, a lawyer, was off work for six weeks, and when he got back to work, his inbox was like, you know, several thousand emails. He thought about it. And he, 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 he pressed um, all and deleted the lot. Only three people came back to him. And actually, we, we put too much store by, by email. And actually, people find another way around. Next question, comment, yeah? And then we'll go to <coughs> man in the red shirt, yeah. Uh, Neil McLaughlin from Kishman Whitefield. <coughs> A lot of the uh, new brave world seems to be focused on the individual, uh, but we know that every orchestra needs a conductor, every good football team needs a coach. In this brave new world, where are the conductors and coaches? Good question. I think, I think as Dave hinted, I mean, we're, we're told that managers must become leaders. You know, the idea of management by supervision and by input has to move to leadership. And the key that we're hearing, of course, is output-based, um, yeah. you know, so mm -hmm. results-based. Um, now that takes a different style and different uh, way of mentoring and, 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 and managing and motivating. It's interesting, I mean, worth asking Charles Handy that because in, in some of his writings he's talked about the idea that actually employment is dead as a concept, that people are corporate citizens and in effect they get paid for their added value, they're given an, an advance against the added value they'll bring the organisation, is his view as to where the world is heading. So maybe that's where we're going, maybe it's much more about individual empowerment. I don't know what you think, Dave. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's this focus on outcomes. I think it's the focus on uh, trying to get the best from the individuals, not what you think they should do. So, for example, one of the things we talk about is a, a manager typically will get asked to do something by their boss. They take the email with the ask in and they decipher the email and they say, right, you do that, you do that, you do that. A leader takes the ask and says, right, this is what we need to do. How are we going to do it? And it's really subtle. But again, back to this whole point about engagement and empowerment, you're actually asking the individual at that point to use this thing between their ears, to use their wisdom and experience and be professional. And it makes a massive difference, especially if you're in uh, maybe a, a slightly ambiguous business where the world is changing around you, you need to think very differently. It's not just about these standardized processes. So we think that's really the direction of travel. OK. Gentlemen down here. Hi, um, Tom Ball from Neardesk. I'd like to challenge both of you if I can, because you seem right, to have this... Outside now, come on. <laughs> 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 that's, that's um, oh. you, you both seem to have this hidden assumption that innovation happens when you've got really, 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 really diverse people who have their salary paid by the same company. Is it not possible that you could have innovation by having people that are working anywhere, but in locations where you've got people from different companies, and that's where true innovation will come from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. It's a bit of both, though, right? But, but I think the, the genuine, sort of the transformational innovation comes from what you've just described. And it's you know, the, the adjacent possible. It's about bumping into people who have got a very different view on your life. Even my example, I work for Microsoft. I love working for Microsoft. But I effectively work with a bunch of people who are the same person as me. We work in the same industry for the same company, we have the same customers, we have the same problems, and we use the same tools to solve those problems. You know, yes, we're creative, and yes, we're innovative, but if you really want to change things up, it's coming to events like this, talking to people who aren't in the IT industry, who are going to make me think differently, that will inform my thinking and lead to better innovation. So I think it is about mixing it up, and it's about giving individuals the opportunity to bump into different mindsets, different ideas, and then be able to use them. That's where serendipity really plays a part for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. I think, you know, some, some of the co-work spaces that, that we've seen where people are kind of individuals and atomized, you know, corporates are looking at those and say, hmm, can we, can we, you know, replicate and learn from this amazing energy and interaction that's taking place? But I think almost they're live social networks, aren't they? You know, you have a host, you have someone who's kind of creating the glue, you've got a phenomenal bunch of, of motivated people who are passionate about what they're doing. So yes, I think that can drive huge innovation. And perhaps that's a little bit about what is going on here as well. I mean, I think you raise a really interesting mm. point that, I mean, one of the narratives of work tech, especially over the last five years, is that the kind of technology that Dave and Philip are talking about are testing the limitations of the corporation. Corporations were formed in the last 200 years based on bringing down transactional costs. But if you can connect to anybody anywhere, why put people into buildings? Why employ them? Why create these structures? And it seems that, that technology is running way ahead of organizational structure. And of course, this has huge implications for how you manage people, how you design workplaces, mm -hmm. and so on. And I think that's been one of, I would say, that's been yeah. the most compelling narrative of work tech, is the dissolution of the, of the corporation. Lady in red. I've always wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Bridget Hardy from the Cabinet Office. Um, talking about getting people together um, and co-working spaces, what about the virtual co-working space, though? Because I think that's what you were talking about, Dave. Is it actually going to be the case that meeting in the virtual space is going to be as good um, and have this sort of serendipitous um, creativity, the, these ideas bouncing off each other. Um, is that ever going to be as good as the real thing? I'd like to think it is. Um, and that's the challenge that I think a lot of people have with working virtually, is that in fact it's not as good as coming together and meeting like in a room like today. That's a lovely question. Thanks, Bridget. I, I, um you know, I'm conflicted in how to answer that, because the human side of me says that you, you can't beat the reality of being there physically. And so maybe my response will be, it's going to be a hell of a lot better. And, and the thing is, we've already seen from our studies, even the sort of the horrible video conferencing we have today, where the camera's staring right there in the face and you feel all so, that's a lot better than just being on the telephone. And then we move to a world where we're already seeing things where you've got whole room uh, video conferencing. So the, what I'm, I'm standing talking to you, and actually I can, you're there almost in person. And I've got that you know, incredible extra amount of information about how I can see your body language and how we can communicate. That's not that far away. And culturally, we're getting more used to those tools, so we get more out of them. But I always resist an argument that, that says all or nothing. So we have this, we're never going to meet in person. Well, I, I don't think that's right. There may be situations. We have you know, lots of individuals who are managing teams, for example, in India or China. And it's really difficult for them to get out. But actually, they use different tools and techniques to build some of that social connection. So I think it's going to get a lot better. But I really think you can't underestimate the power of finding the right time for you all to be together in person. I, I think actually it's something slightly, slightly different, just to kind of just to challenge that, Dave. Because I think the technology that you've given us so far for the office is all very kind of narrow and defined and has been quite linear. I think the answer is to look at gaming. I think if you look at where gaming is going, and you look at how anybody who's a gamer, most of our children, I guess, are gamers, the way they're living and interacting in games, I think is much, uh, much more interesting as a vision for how we might collaborate virtually than the kind of video conferencing room where you try and dial in and see somebody across I, 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 I think that's a, a great point. And I think yeah. the great leap forward that we're about to see on the 
22nd of November, in case you're interested. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so nothing. Um, but, you know, video conferencing today is, is a separate activity. So if you want to collaborate, let's say you're working on a document. If you want to collaborate, I have to step outside of what we're collaborating on so I can then co collaborate. That doesn't work. What you're going to see on the 22nd of November is uh, a game platform that enables you in-game and also while watching a movie to bring in Skype, to bring in video conferencing. So all of a sudden, you're in the context of what you're doing. And I think that's a, real, that's a huge step forward. And I think we're going to see that kind of theme play out just to bring together the, the, the medium, the transmission forms of communication against the thing that you're actually collaborating with. So I think that's a great point, Philip. It's another big change we're going to see. At this point, can I just get a, get a feel for our audience today? How many people are working in workplace technology? Okay, quite a lot. How many people are in the architecture, design, space planning business? Okay. How many people are in HR, kind of people management, consulting? Yeah, a smaller group. How many people are kind of property, real estate? Okay, quite a lot. How many people thought they were going to get a lecture on Egyptian mummies and around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's over there. Um, okay. Um, question? Final question. Yeah? Jim? Mm -hmm. And there was one up there as well, so we'll, we'll, have, we'll have two. <coughs> Thanks, Jeremy. It's Jim Reed from Arup. Um, I'd like to pick up on something. I think it was Philip. You said you were in Silicon Valley and you walked into a building and there was no one there. It felt like a morgue. And it just, uh, just re reminds me that, OK, the technology has enabled us to collaborate better um, and it makes it very much easier to work in a mobile fashion. Uh, but you walk into buildings these days, and I've seen loads of statistics over the last five years, and it's not getting any better, where at any one time the building is only about half full. And we can see this trend of new high-rise buildings going up in the city, and I'm just wondering, have we got it wrong? And do we need this much space, and are we going to be in real trouble, or am I panicking? <laughs> no, I think, I mean, Silicon Valley is really interesting, because, of course, the Yahoo-Marissa debate about coming back into the office was obviously very pertinent and we're seeing more and more people come back to the city. So a lot of the new big offices for Twitter, for Yelp, um, for Pinterest and others are now back in the city in kind of the Soma area, not, not down in Mountain View or in, Red, in, 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 in Redwood and so on. So it's really interesting to see whether, you know, to attract young people, you don't put them on buses down the 101 for two hours every day, but you have to kind of put them where they want to be going forwards. So I think, yes, buildings need to be in the right place. Whether they need to be smaller, you know, question mark. It's about the kind of atmosphere and the, the buzz. This, this building was a huge, old-fashioned, monolithic headquarters, you know, with, with multiple floors, with sealed offices, with cubes, and you saw nobody. So I think it's all about the right space as opposed to, you know, no space, if that makes sense. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I just think you're seeing a convergence of uh, the old world and the new world. So we've got an old world mindset around the infrastructure, the building. Let's have a big office so all of our people can be here all at once. And then you've got a very different work style that's evolving. And I just don't think we've yet caught up with what that might mean. It's a bold organization that's going to step forward and reduce their size or even federate their office space so that actually there's a bunch of different organizations coming in to what was their office to work. So I think it's just we're in this transition period is some of that. Okay. Question at the back there. I wasn't sure if you were actually talking about this or I just had a sort of creative moment, but were you, Could you do you envision? Your, your, your name and your... Uh... Sorry. It's Jane Kahane. I'm taking over from Kathy Hayward on facilities management. Okay, Jeremy. thank you. Uh, but yeah, my question is whether or not we, uh, you expect to see um, holographic video conferencing in the future, or some kind of beam me up, Scotty, kind of way of interacting. I thought you might appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I have, I have to tell you, uh, we, we already, in our labs, our research labs, we've created a prototype of the Star Trek uh, holodeck, right? So you walk into an environment, not only does the room configure around you, we've got 3D interactive projections. So there's a guy who can roll a projected ball, you know, and throw it around the room. So some of that is coming. You know, I think 
Uh, it's a while away, but there are certainly lots of interesting development happening in, in that space. So, I, you know, I don't think that's beyond the realms of possibility. Eight years. Yeah. Eight years. <laughs> Let's pick a number. Yeah, eight years sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> okay, time for one last question just down here. Hi, it's Jane Estrellitz, and it isn't a question, it's a, um, an observation. I think we're making too much of a deal about presence technologies in the workplace or not. I think people are taking the lead in the rest of their lives. I mean, I was in, on a bus in Oxford Street recently, and there was a woman playing with her grandchild in South America on FaceTime while she was on the bus in London. I was with some people in Spain where the, their daughter phoned from London and asked if they'd mind the baby while she got the shopping out of the car. And, you know, doctors now say, I'll see you on Skype, the justice system is moving that way. So why are we so rigid about is this possible or not? Of course, it will all be imported from everyone's real life into the workplace. Okay. Thank you very much. Any comments? 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 Well, I think you're right. I think people are using it in their social lives. You know, hence the, this explosion of social media to a billion plus people on Facebook. You don't yet see it in the corporate world. We still kind of come in, we sit down at our desks, we log into our PC, and we start up office, and off we go it's in the a out, linear way. Outdated structures of the corporation. Yeah. I don't know what you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. What's interesting about the whole presence thing is I think we're, we're evolving. Even our, I mean, you used the phrase which I love, Philip, which is digital etiquette. Because mm -hmm. I hate it when I've left my setting to available, when I'm actually working, I'm doing something, I'm using my brain. And I, I just, I, I need to redefine what those settings mean to me and be much more proactive about using them. And so it's this evolution of how we change and use those tools to match our personal experience. I think it's absolutely right. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dave Coplin and Philip Ross. Don't forget that if you book on a KLM flight, you'll run into your <laughs> Facebook stalker. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but a fascinating glimpse into the future. Thank you very much, Philip and Dave. Thank you.